Hello and welcome to uh, this uh, Qatar Economic Forum Roundtable on Space-Based Internet, the Future of Global, global Communications. Uh, my name is Matthew Boxham. I am a Senior Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence and lead uh, the research on the uh, TMT industries in the EMEA region. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel of distinguished experts. I'm going to be moderating the session. Uh, I'm hoping the panel is going to be making that job incredibly easy uh, with their insights on this incredibly fascinating uh, topic. We've got about 45 minutes uh, to discuss things um, and hopefully uh, we're going to be talking about some kind of really interesting um, parts of the space internet world and uh, provide you with some valuable insights to, to take away. If you do want to find out more about our panellists, uh, please go to the um, portal and you'll be able to find some more information in their personal bios. Um, so, so I think hopefully uh, the panel will make my job as moderator very easy for me, but I'm going to start the session uh, with a fairly open-ended question, which will hopefully um, kick off the debate uh, today. Um, and that, I guess, is kind of two questions in one, really. Um, the first is really, you know, is space um, the future of the internet? Um, and if it is the future of the internet, what does that really mean for what the internet can and will be uh, in the future? Um, so with that kind of uh, quite broad question out there on the table, um, just wonder if one of our panelists wants to uh, take a first go at um, answering those questions. Well, I, I'd love to, I'll, I'll take a crack at that, Matthew. Um, I'm Matt Desch, I'm the CEO of Iridium. And, uh, uh, in this role about 15 years or so. And, you know, it is not the future, it is a future. I mean, the internet has now gone from something we all started using back in the uh, in the 90s for the first time. It's hard to believe it's only been about 25 years that the internet has even existed. And it has expanded. I mean, I was an early, early uh, in the cellular industry uh, before I got into space. And, you know, wireless has expanded over the last 30 plus years now, we think it's a ubiquitous thing, but it really only covers about 12 to 15% of the Earth's surface today. And 5G is actually, which is quite exciting in terms of the bandwidth and speed that it's gonna bring, is still gonna basically be built within that 12 to 15% footprint. Um, and so the rest of the Earth uh, is unfortunately not covered, if if not covered by satellites and and has been covered the internet has been in space now for oh you know since the beginning uh we beamed expensive pipes to people on the ground uh in remote places in our case uh provided that in a very highly mobile service but it hasn't been uh, as ubiquitous and low cost and easy to use as I think it will be becoming in the next couple of years uh, with all the new networks being built. There's a lot of investment going into space right now. And uh, so it's not just being built for the first time in space, but it's really possibly becoming more cost effective and effective to use space-based connections to cover 100% of the world where um, we really didn't have that uh, say 10, 15, 20 years ago. I just want to build on a point you raised there. <clears throat> what we've seen even in the past, say, five years is that space access has been redefined. You know, the cost of getting anything up into orbit is probably about a quarter of what it used to cost five years ago. Uh, and, and sorry for, for context here, my name is Mina. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Kepler Communications, where we've got a network of satellites up in orbit. So we've seen this firsthand where Regulators are changing their tax. They're enabling new commercial uses of space. Uh, and that hasn't happened before. We're seeing that space access in of itself is becoming uh, sort of more inexpensive. Uh, these are, and the know-how to be able to access space has fundamentally changed. So all these attributes have come together now, which didn't exist a few years ago, that are enabling us to think about the use of space in a different way. Where now space-based internet is a much more viable proposition where space-based uh, other applications are much more viable because just the fundamental cost equation has come down such a significant amount. And the regulatory framework has enabled commercial actors to step in and go out and produce their own equivalent of what were traditionally government services. I would be the uh, 
kind of the other advocate. I do believe that, yeah, I agree with you. I think space based internet now, when it comes to businesses and enterprises, it's there. But when it comes to the mass market, it's still, it's not there. I do believe that we, we really need to address affordability. We really need to address regulatory problem. We really need to address the cost of the terminal and services till, till this had not been addressed, still space uh, uh, internet will be reality only for uh, part of this world. I think also, I think the, it's quite apparent that the thirst of the internet is there for the world and everyone in it. And, and, and that is there for, and it's forever growing, you know, that everyone wants the internet no matter where they are. And I guess uh, what you said, Mina, about the cost of, of actually getting what you're getting um, will obviously be driven down by more people entering your sector and spending more time, resource and energy, uh, making it more cost effective uh, and putting more resource and funding into it. I mean, it's no different than the telecom sector before, you know, 20, 30 years ago, like Matt said, you know, when we were first there with the, the, the bases, um, it was very, very expensive. Uh, and it was a, it's a, cost of entry was expensive. Now, as things are developing, yourself and people like Fabian and people like Matt that are, are going and spending the time, energy and building the teams and there's more businesses enter, and more companies entering the sector, it's, it's going to make that 12%, you know, a, a lot a lot greater, I think, um, I, in my personal opinion. Yes, I, I fully agree with, the, with that point. Um, I'm the CEO of Astrocast and at Astrocast we are operating um, a satellite uh, IoT network. So we're talking about Internet of Things, so low bandwidth uh, application, uh, which allows our customer to expand their, uh, their IoT strategy to, to the entire planet, to especially the remote uh, regions of the, of the world. So when you talk to the, the, the users of, of these, these solutions, it's clear that um, business is global, but uh, affordable connectivity is still very far from, from global. Uh, as, as Matt uh, described really well, uh, only 15% of the globe is, is covered uh, with terrestrial communication networks. And this is still a major challenge that has, that has to be uh, tackled. And, and many existing players are, are tackling this, this challenge. We know them. Uh, especially in the broadband industry with major projects like Starlink from SpaceX, OneWeb uh, and, and others. Uh, so they, they're trying to bring high bandwidth internet accessible to everyone. Uh, but uh, what, I, what I see as well is that what, what is true for the broadband market is also true for the IoT market. Uh, there is a similar uh, major challenge in the low bandwidth application to be solved. And, and when, when you look at the 15% at the of, the, of the globe covered by, by terrestrial network, uh, you see a massive uh, growing, uh, massive growth of the, of the IoT connections. Uh, we expect something like 5 billion connections by 2025. Uh, but this massive growth in this small, dense, this dense, dense areas makes the need for global satellite IoT connectivity even more obvious in, in even more ur urgent i would say and and several studies are showing that uh, there is an even sh even much greater growth expected in the satellite internet of things uh, over the over the coming uh, coming years uh, but for for this massive growth to uh, to happen we need a new generation of, of, of satellite. We need new generation of infrastructure networks. And, and this is what, uh, what we have developed at Astrocast during the past seven years. We, we have been working on this new generation of you know, smaller satellites uh, focused on only one type of, of service in this very specific and, and cost sensitive uh, IoT market. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that this is now something that, that is credible. We can actually offer a credible extension to all the terrestrial IoT networks. Yeah, I think Fabian, you're right about the cost element because as much as people want the internet and they want the IoT element of the internet, there gets to a point where even in a commercial uh, offering, it, there is a fine line between the cost and the, the benefit of having the internet. Um, and, and like I said, I think it's, it gets to the point where there needs to be, you know, the investment in the sector to allow the IoT products to be cost effective 
within the commercial environment. Um, otherwise, it just becomes a, a, a you know a, a vanity exercise because yes, you've got the connectivity, but the cost is so expensive um, of usage. Uh, it sort of outweighs everything else, I suppose. How far along the, um, the, the the kind of curve of reducing the cost of uh, a getting to space and the kind of equipment um, that we put in space? Uh, do, do we think? You know, I mean, you know, I think um, I think it's bad that I mentioned you know the uh, the kind of factor of four reduction in, in cost over the last decade also you know do we expect to see um further con con similar reductions in in the cost of uh, space-based internet uh, going forward or, or are we essentially kind of going to see things plateau out i think uh, i'll give a crack at that i mean you, you have to uh, to differentiate between the cost of getting to space and putting things into space which has improved it is not as quite as dramatic overall getting to space as has probably, uh, I don't know if it's a factor of four, but it's it's reduced quite a bit, particularly thanks to SpaceX and some investments in now, I think there's 150 different launchers are being developed, which unfortunately, there's only capacity for about five or 10 of those. So we'll see, um, fortunately, there's gonna be some shakeout there, but uh, the costs have come down in launch. Um, uh, satellites have become smaller Unfortunately, they don't last as long. So, you know, you have to you have to launch them every few years instead of, you know, in case of sort of a network like ours where they might last 15 to 20, most of them are lasting five to seven. So the capital replenishment costs are quite high still. So it hasn't dramatically increased, de decreased the overall cost of getting the space. What has, de looks like it's gonna decrease quite a bit is the cost of service, uh, which Bab was talking about, Ian's talking about. That's coming through competition, which is exciting. Um, I mean, Fabian has 20 or 30 different competitors to a small IoT network. Mina is the same way. They're really coming into a very crowded space right now, and they're hoping that there is very, very high demand. We all do different things, by the way. I just want to make that that point uh, for those here. We we really do complement our services, those in the field. And in fact, we don't compete with. OneWeb and SpaceX and those people, they're offering commercial broadband services. Um, there's a lot of different plans. It's just there's been so much investment in the last few years. The question will be, as these costs come down, will they cover the capital costs that are quite still high in space? It still is very expensive uh, to put things into space. It takes a long time. It's quite challenging technically. There haven't been any incredible breakthroughs in um, in uh, things that just completely remake the, uh, the question. So we'll all move to space and not do anything on the ground anymore. Uh, but it has gotten better. And I think some really the best services with the best business cases will will survive. Um, you know, obviously we come from a, we're a bit of a cautionary tale as a company. You know, we're 31 years from, from the idea inception that the, uh, you know, and have sort of had a, had to have a restart along the way, has, has many companies in the space industry. And, um, you know, it's, it's why we constantly are reminding people, don't just look at the service and the excitement there were provided. It's a holistic, you know, the company has to be successful and survive and thrive long term to be able to really continue to uh, operate in the space. So where we've experienced maybe some slight differences is the massive investments in space has allowed for new things to develop and new ways of uh, putting up the infrastructure. So if you even look at Q1 last year compared to Q1 this year, last year we had something like $1.2 billion invested in space. This quarter in 2021 Q1, we've had $5.7 billion invested, which is a massive uptick, you know, comparing year over year. But what that's also allowed people to do is look at space in a different way, where we're seeing some dramatic cost reductions on physically putting up assets. So in the case of, you know, what uh, what Iridium had done, they, they built these really long life assets meant to operate for 15 years, and it's an entirely different paradigm. But right now, when we're seeing some of the reductions in launch costs, we can put up satellites that have a five to seven year life, produce them on mass, and have them significantly lower costs than it would be if we were to 
make an equivalent asset that's meant to launch and operate for a 15 year life cycle. Even accounting for the fact that you have to recycle them and upgrade them, you still net out at a significant cost reduction, which is what's translating into the service reduction. And the other major thing that's taking place, I think at large in the, in the sector is we're seeing actually a bit of convergence from cellular networks to satellite networks where a lot of the 5G ambitions call for the use of not only cellular, but also non-terrestrial networks. So lower earth orbit satellites and having a convergence between the standards is one of the other features, if you will, that's enabling massive cost reductions in space that didn't exist before. By the way, I, I, I don't disagree that there isn't a lot of investment in space right now. I mean, uh, I, and I, I do believe that any individual network has a better chance of succeeding, ha having a better cost structure profile. Um, the problem is there's just a lot of them right now that that really high investment has created a lot of competition for you and others. Um, um, you know, I, I've, I've uh, spent a lot of time trying to make sure the company really focuses on areas that others aren't really going into and trying to find a way out of that. There are a lot of commodity growth. I mean, there's not a lot of really difference between individual broadband companies, which aren't really recognized, uh, represented here. They all offer service through a big dish and maybe that dish is $500 or $1,000. Most of them are a little bit more than that these days and they offer $100 service. But, and you know, if for example, let's use SpaceX Starlink, which is really, I think got the best chance of success, uh, if they, really, really, you know, I mean, they're, they're spending 10 billion, $15 billion on this network. They need to generate 25, $30 billion of ongoing revenue, which I think they could do if they were the only ones up there, but they're now going to compete with Amazon, with OneWeb, with all the existing, um, you know, Intel set, Utel set, SES, uh, and, and their companies, uh, even you, I mean, you're going to come in there with a service that is going to offer something, um, competitive there. And so, you know, that's billion dollars. I hope it's, I hope there's $150 billion or $200 billion of, of opportunity there for everybody, but you're also still at, at some point competing with orange and Vodafone and, and AT&T and Cox cable and Comcast and hundreds of other, um, uh, and every other, uh, countries, you know, telecom infrastructure. So, it's an interesting time. Everybody, I mean, you know, this is a financially oriented sort of uh, probably viewership who are looking to where do I want to put my money? And I think it's, I, I think we just got to be careful not to only cheerlead that technology will solve all issues because there are many cautionary tales in our industry uh, of people that look good on paper and then too many people came in and, and not, not everyone was successful. Everyone on this call will be successful, just not what's out there. But it sounds to me that with regards to the technology and what you're suggesting, it's more evolution rather than revolution. You know, it's more about evolving the, the, what you're doing and who you're doing it for. But don't you think, Matt, that people will find their feet and in a crowded space, you know, the, the fittest dogs will survive and they will, they will crack on and they'll provide and they'll find their niches, like in every, even in the telecom sector. You know, um, everyone went out and made phones, for example, and then a handful survived. Uh, I've said and they before, the best technology that will make the most success in our industry is patience. Uh, you know, it is the fact that, you know, this, this, the, the losses of satellite companies 10, 15 years ago were due to investors who just didn't have patience because satellite networks no matter how hard you work at it still take five to ten years to even get to sort of profitability and if you don't and even then you know it takes years to cover the capital costs so you know we're quite successful right now and and quite valuable but it took us 31 years to get there I mean, well 30 years we've been we've been in this mode for one year so i'm i'm expecting Mina and Fabian, others to do that in half the time, but that's still not what their investors are expecting. Their investors want to do it in in 10% of that time or 20% of that time. And hopefully, you know, we have fortunately a lot of billionaires in this industry right now. I hope they have long, longer, you know, time horizons if you're Sir Richard Branson or Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. But that is one of the things that's complicating sort of the story here a little bit because 
um, and especially sovereign countries taking over OneWeb with the UK and India. You know, I don't know what the business case there was to take a company out of bankruptcy there that still had a lot of investment. But if they did, I mean, they just need patience. I think they'll be successful. It just may not be in two years or three years. It may be in five years or 10 years. And so that's something for investors to look at. These are very valuable businesses. Just hang in there. You know, That's what's important. Yeah, but it's, it's like the telecom sector. You know, you go back many years, they had to spend all that money in cell sites and infrastructure. And I guess, you know, um, it's a long term play. Um, the, the, the requirements there, the thirst is there, the demand is there. It's, uh, it's as long as, uh, like you said. It's a little different, Bab, because like in DC where I'm at, you know, I remember selling the equipment here to supply DC. The, the initial contract for DC was about $20 million of infrastructure, and they were making money at that point. If we were doing that today and you wanted to compete in space, it's often billions of dollars before you even have a chance to compete. So it's, you know, it makes for very much higher kind of risk uh, orientation in some cases. The, the ratchets are a lot higher. Yeah. yeah. Matt, what about if you will add the regulatory hurdle to it? Because I agree with you, financial, it's a kind of aspect is very critical for uh, for satellite company. Add to it the regulatory hurdle, especially in our region. It's very, very hard, you know, I would say, uh, spectrum is a finite and just getting the the filing the approval the uh, coordination the, the, that's another story to, to to add that's absolutely true you're you're and you're an expert at that especially in that region there um i mean we we have to deal with it all over the world landing rights and stuff is is a challenge for people uh the regulatory requirements for uh intercept and all these things which are all important and necessary but they have to be done on a global scale uh, in most of our businesses, as opposed to a national scale. If you were a new cellular operator, you know, you would be dealing with that in a city or something, not in, not over the whole world. I just have a, a few, a few points regarding, I think it's important to, again, to make the difference between broadband internet and, and internet of things where you can actually, you know, Develop and 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 and, and deploy uh, assets in space. For I think it's important to put some some numbers here. Um, I, I agree that I completely agree with with, uh, with Matt's comments on on especially on this billion billion dollars um, constellations. But when when you look at um, I'm from the nano satellite industry. The size of our satellites is is, is very uh, very small. We're talking the size of a shoebox, right? So, you know, less than ten kilograms. Uh, the cost to produce a satellite like this is is uh, is, is a quarter of, of a million, and it's about the same to launch. So with with half a million, you put a satellite in orbit, and um, we intend to launch a hundred of them. We already have a seven operational. We launched five uh, this this Friday with SpaceX. Uh, so so basically with fifty million. Um, you can we can launch uh, 100 satellites and 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 so so this I think this number is important because uh, when when you compare uh, several billions with uh, with uh, you know less than 100 millions it does make a, a big difference for what we can we can uh, offer to our customer now the lifetime is shorter uh, of this asset I agree with, with that however what we have seen uh, over the the past 10-15 uh, years is is, is how quickly the technology is evolving uh, on, on the ground. And, and your satellite, after three, four, five years, your satellite start to become obsolete. And we think it's actually a good thing to, to replace them uh, every three to five years so that you keep the best performance uh, in orbit. You keep the best, and you can even potentially reduce the size of these assets even further uh, down the road. So uh, our approach uh, is, is, very, is to be, uh, you know, fully integrate the, the design of the satellite in, in the company to be very vertically integrated and to control that the evolution of the infrastructure, not only on the satellites and all the other elements are essential as well, but uh, all together, uh, specifically in the Internet of Things, there is really a, a, a nice play where uh, you can you can actually uh, provide some really cost effective solution uh, globally. And, and that can be more uh, more and more consistent with the pricing you see in the terrestrial um, uh, cellular networks. 
I, 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 I want to I want to just reiterate your point, and I mean, because I don't want my comments to be viewed as a, a negative overall, but I want to like shout out for you and Mina and and those who are building what I would call um, small smaller you know networks that are taking smaller cuts at it are are I think you're not appreciated nearly as much as these mega constellations of broadband uh, of these. You know, global consumer broadband, which seems sexier in many ways, but have more challenges because of their size and scope. I really do think that these small IoT companies you guys represent um, are underappreciated in terms of the potential for them. So I, I, I encourage people to take a, a deeper look at, at your sector. There's still a lot of companies that you're competing against, but as Bob, Bob said, you'll the fittest will survive and you, you will be taking a more appropriate kind of swing at, at an opportunity as opposed to spending $10 billion before you know whether they say the proverbial dogs eat the dog food in, in, in sufficient quantities, you know, so. I think though it's important because we talk about internet as a blanket statement. You know, it's as though that internet is the same thing across the board and it's universal and it means the same thing to everybody, but it's pretty important for us to distinguish you know, what internet means to different users. There is broadband consumer internet. There's commercial aviation. There is um, sort of maritime VSAT networks or virtual private networks. There's a broad range of what internet means. And I think what we're hearing through the course of this panel is that diversity in what internet means. So there's applications in internet that are being described, you know, by Fabian around IoT. That is a form of internet. It's a form of data transfer. And then there's the extreme end on the consumer case, which is looking to invest billions for, you know, competition with uh, rural in-home uh, sort of terrestrial internet. And I think it's uh, pertinent for this particular crowd who's observing the panel to try and get an appreciation where in the internet market they'd like to play. You know, is it against the big swings, several tens of billions of dollars, consumer broadband applications, and that's where they think the potential is because we want to grow and expand in that domain. Is it on the other spectrum of the internet? And there's applications all the way through, whether that's um, you know for the enterprise use cases and a wide variety of applications that I think even Iridium covers. And not all of them require the same amount of capital or the same infrastructure approach to make them successful. So in the consumer broadband orientation, yes, it's tens of billions of dollars and probably a few decades before there's recognizable value to the investors in some interim of that spectrum of what um, sort of internet means, there are uh, applications and infrastructure that cost 50 to $100 million and can return in a five to 10 year horizon. You know, I still think the lesson learned from uh, history's past is that patience is required, but we do have a lot of capital that is patient coming into the sector in a way that's never been done before. I think we have some of the most optimistic future that's ever existed for the space sector uh, that is here and now where we are, where beforehand we didn't have the right market conditions or regulatory support or even know how to be able to access space. All that's changed to allow for this broad spectrum of internet usage. And that's why I'm very optimistic on the future and what it might hold. I, I totally agree with that. And uh, to, to also build on what uh, Hessa uh, said uh, before, um, the, the success is a combination of factor on the technology side, and as, as we all know, it's it's also it's all about spectrum, finding the right spectrum, getting access uh, in in the different regions, and then getting the the commercial licenses in in, in every country. Uh, this is this is critical, and and uh, this is clearly an effort that should not be underestimated, and that that is a significant uh, work for for every satellite uh, successful satellite uh, operator. Yeah, I think it's a very exciting space, um, <laughs> pardon the pun, but it's 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 a very exciting situation um, you guys are in. Um, I think um, as you provide a solution uh, to various demands and needs of today's society uh, and business uh, and, com and commerce, it will evolve um, in like every sector. Mina, you're right, you're absolutely right. You know, what, what you can do today was Capable, you were capable of doing it ten years ago, but nowhere near as easy as it is easier. Not it's not easy, but easier than what it was. Um, and to have, I think it's like anything in it. If you've got a plan and a strategy and a use, rather than it's just there, and then find the use, 
uh, that's the key. Um, and I think Fabian said, look, you know, with IoT, there's a use with the the products and the units and the, the stuff that you're doing. So if there is a demand and a use for it, it's a natural fit then, isn't it? Rather than, oh, we've got this, what should we use it for? Yeah, I, yeah. I just try to encourage people, especially startups and everything, to try to go and do your own thing. You know, I, I feel like it's like a soccer game, you know, football for most of those around the world. You know, that little kids play where it seems like everybody chases the ball originally until they figure out how to play, you know, a unique position. And uh, that's been a little bit of that going on here. I think what, what we try really hard to do is to is to focus on what other people aren't focusing on. So, you know, for example, protecting GNSS systems, you know, I mean, that's one of the services that we provide is to augment GPS and, and uh, other kinds of systems to make them more resilient. We're, we're tracking airplanes in real time in a way that can't be done by any other system um, because we're using, you know, the unique nature of our network that other people haven't chosen to implement. Um, tracking ships real time, and, and I mean, not not using satellite signals, but using the standard signals that ships are broadcasting to each other and picking those things up from space. Um, you know, there there are applications, and I and I think even as you get into IoT, you know, Fabian and Mina, there are not going to sort of after the standard high volume applications, but doing the service better than anybody else can do it in a very specific way. That I think will bring success to specific companies who really kind of try to tackle things in a better way than others. I think the challenge is if you're a lot like everybody else, and, and if this, if satellites commoditize, it's a great thing for consumers, but it will be challenging for the companies involved in it who just chase, um, chase prices down. That's the real fear and why the value of a lot of the broadband internet companies uh, that are going to space are quite low right now, because there's a real concern there could be overcapacity right now. That's not what we represent here where none of us are going after that business right now, but that's a real fear in that in that segment. That isn't as big a fear right now in the IOT and personal communication segment that we represent or others, you know, right now. Yeah, that's a great uh, point to raise, Matt, and I think it ties with Hess's comments around spectrum, where at the outset choice of spectrum has an impact on the type of service that's going to be delivered. Right, and that choice of spectrum by way of its regulatory approvals, by way of its uh, RF characteristics and interference environment sort of create that differentiation. And I think noting that Radium operates in L-band, you know, our, our business operates in S-band, KU and KA band. Uh, you have Fabian's business that's operating in L-band. These all differentiate a little bit in terms of what services will be offered and enables us now to kind of segment and grow a clearer division between the different services that are being offered. So it's another great uh, avenue to look for the differentiation between these respective businesses around what frequency bands are they using, what access do they have in which countries, because while we advertise a global operation, it's still a very much country by country game. We need to go into each individual country that we want to operate in, prove that we can uh, provide the relevant service and adhere to their regulatory requirements. And the sort of regulatory regime and the spectrum portfolio that any company has will by its very nature differentiate how the business operates. Well, one thing I'd like to maybe pick up, up on a bit, um, which I guess isn't the, the natural space for any of your business models, but it, it is the consumer internet and also the you know, sp uh, SpaceX with Starlink is um, in the lead right now in terms of offering um, a kind of uh, a space-based internet product for the consumer market. But, you know, we've seen lots of interest in this area for a decade or more, you know, quite often with a, uh, uh, a kind of motivation to um, kind of reduce the digital, digital divide in, 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 um, in countries where connectivity perhaps isn't quite so prevalent. But I guess when you look at something like Starlink and it costs $99 a month and Four to five hundred dollars down for the equipment. Uh, it kind of feels like it's, uh, you know, um, inaccessible uh, from a financial perspective for perhaps some of the regions where there might be the kind of greatest underlying demand or or kind of need for internet connectivity. I just kind of wonder if you've got kind of thoughts or observations about how you kind of 
bridge the gap between what these services look like they're going to cost uh, and actually making them accessible to um, you know, um, people that perhaps only have a few dollars of income a day. Yeah, I think this, it's kind of hard for us to un understand over here in the U.S. because $99 a month is the cheapest, you know, satellite internet's ever been delivered uh, before. It's really a whole new price point. And yet, as soon as you put that out there, you realize it's nowhere near what's necessary for um, the developing world. You know, there's always been this dream of the other three billion, as they were called. You know, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, a company got created, you know, called O3B around that name because... Uh, and I've been in telecom over 40 years, you know, and we constantly are finding new technologies. I was involved in point to multipoint and wireless internet and all kinds of things in my in my previous life. Um, we're getting closer and closer and satellite, you know, is, is bringing promise. But when an ARPU average revenue per unit and, you know, in India is a dollar, you know, for cellular phones, you know, how are you going to really compete it's a dollar for a reason not because of competition it's because that's what people can afford you know and and that's what really uh will deliver the service in those areas so i will tell you the key technology breakthrough that probably is needed more than anything else um, we're still waiting on is the terminal cost not so much the service cost um you know SpaceX is delivering that terminal for $499, but it's costing them at least three to four times that much to make it. If you really want to do it on a massive scale, you really got to get to really, really high volumes and get to a $100 terminal or less. Uh, that The physics aren't there quite yet for that. That's a few years away. Uh, that's a big part of it. And then pricing it per, you know, Per, uh, per month or whatever it might be. I mean, SpaceX has taken the biggest swing at that because they're just massive numbers of satellites and they're hoping to provide the most capacity so that they can somehow drive the cost the lowest possible. That's not possible for everyone else's system, which is why most people aren't chasing them into the consumer sector. They're, they're looking to provide industrial internet connections to airplanes and ships and those sort of things. So, um, it's going to be a challenge to get down to that level that will really serve Africa. That is the hope and dream. But, you know, we just saw Google, for example, with their Loon initiative, give up on it because it's really hard to do. And uh, Facebook and others have been trying to do it from high altitude platform services. Everybody's, I think satellite is the best hope, but there still needs to be kind of a commitment of a mass scale that will drive costs for the devices down to a level that still, I think is still, I don't know, five to 10 years away at least, you know. Um, I'm hopeful, you know, because I think that would be fantastic if we could connect the unconnected. That would bring a lot of people, if not out of poverty, at least give them a chance to, to have an even uh, footing, you know, economically. Um, but, but it's still gonna be a challenge and I think I think SpaceX is fortunate they're private and have billions to kind of work behind the scenes to try to perfect it. But I don't think that they they haven't exposed the business model that says that this is a business success and you want to go and try to compete with them on this yet either. So um, I, I give them I give them a lot of kudos for what they're doing though. They're really really pushing the bounds further than anyone else is, and we'll see uh, where one way gets to and where. Amazon Kuiper and Telesat Leo and, you know, the European network and the Chinese network and the Russian network and everybody else who still uh, have plans to build one of these things too. I still think there's plenty of market for them, you know, while the, the dream would be to get into some of these remote or hard to reach places. In the US, there's probably something like 10 million households that are addressable by the service. In Canada, something like 5 million households that are addressable by the service. So while the dream is to eventually get to those sort of um, applications that are in uh, more remote or hard to reach places or developing countries, I think even now there is a big footprint that is addressable in some of the more developed countries but are just looking for an alternate internet service. Um, so that that's going to help drive maybe to what Matt's point was a little bit earlier, the start of the mass scale adoption to maybe get them down the path where it could go towards the developing countries. So I think I'd be hopeful because there's quite a bit of demand even in the developed nations now to kind of be onboarded into that service, even just by brand value. 
the willingness for someone to adopt a, a SpaceX terminal because it's a Starlink terminal as opposed to um, a Comcast internet line, even if they're going to pay a little bit more money. There's a lot of brand value that's been built that'll help to develop to that mass scale uh, type of opportunity. Yeah, I'm not, and I don't underestimate the brand value and the pull that they will have because the human behavior will also lean towards that and the comfort zone that they're in. Um, but I think you're right about the, the cost of entry for the consumer and how it works. But I think from Fabian's perspective, where he's providing a solution for specific sectors is totally different to, like you said, the, the, the masses of what, you know, uh, a regular broadband and a regular service provider is required. So um, I think there's a big, there's a big difference. I think there's a huge difference um, to need rather than swap. Exactly. Depending on the on the service you're providing, the the hardware that you need the, on the on the terminal side is completely different. And I totally agree about the point regarding expensive, uh, still very expensive hardware and and priced even below the, its cost uh, now for for broadband connectivity. However, in the low bandwidth application, you can now you can now really have a nice uh, product for you know much less than fifty dollars um, to send um, you know tens of hundreds of bytes to a few kilobytes per day per, per asset. This allows a customer to do already many things, uh, but it's, it's again a very different uh, industry with, with different needs and uh, that has to be addressed uh, differently. And the, the infrastructure to serve this part of the industry is, is has to be designed and, and thought really from, from, you know, from bottom up um, in, in a way that, that serves the perfectly the, the needs of these, these customers. Yeah, and I guess you guys are, I mean, obviously the work that you're doing, it's, um, it's going to feed the market, it's going to look at what you're going to provide, uh, and uh, it's going to help, if anything, uh, that sector. Um, it's, you know, it seems to me that some of people that have entered it on a vanity exercise, and they've got gazillions to play around with, whereas um, like Matt said, there's people out there looking at solutions that are doing it cost effectively that have a purpose. And if you've got a good sense of purpose uh, and then a good understanding of the business model, then you will survive and it will work. Yeah. I think there yeah. might be more collaboration between the satellite operator and uh, telecom operator. Still, I would say with 5G, the cooperation started to be more, but I think still there should be more to make uh, the connectivity uh, more affordable uh, to the world. Because for some reason, uh, still communication operator, they think that uh, satellite operator, they are from kind of a different world. That's a good point. That, that is a new thing in the last 12 to 24 months. Um, 5G technologies are moving to space right now, which is uh, will potentially be a disruptive sort of force if that's true. But the real driver, I think, of that are are the mobile phone companies who are who've run out of customers in some ways, you know, and they they're not growing very fast. Um, they're not expanding their footprint at all, and no, they can't. So they hope that space will be a connection for them that will be able to um, allow their customers to roam further. There is no magic from space, though. It won't be the same kind of services from cellular. Uh, that is a new area connecting directly to south to smartphones from space. Uh, that that is coming. Um, some of us are are going to be part of that, and perhaps new networks will drive that. But it won't still be the same exact service. It'll still be an outdoor service. It'll be a lower speed than 5G. Uh, it will provide important connectivity in places where people will, will want to pay for that sort of thing. And so it, it will be a, an important service and it will potentially drive more revenues to mobile phone companies. So I think they're going to be interested in that too. So um, we are kind of into the last um, few seconds of the, the session. So unfortunately I'm going to have to wrap it up. We've had a, what I think is an incredibly rich uh, and diverse um, uh, conversation. So I thank everybody for that. But at the same time, it feels like we've barely touched the surface uh, of what we could um, uh, talk about too. So um, uh, hopefully this is going to be a catalyst for further discussions uh, between us and the 
some at least some of the people that have been been watching. So um, I appreciate uh, everybody's contribution uh, today. Thank you very much for taking part in this round table. Uh, wish you all the best of luck in the future with your uh, respective um, businesses and ventures. And, and hopefully um, our paths will cross again sometime in the near future. So thank you, everybody. And everybody have a good day. Thank, Brilliant. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.